Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, whenever you are. I'm presenting today uh, our work, me and Jalal Nouri from University of Stockholm. I work at University of Eastern Finland, a kind of affiliate to still University of Stockholm. Presented today our work, uh, which is um, high resolution temporal network analysis to understand and improve collaborative learning. <clears throat> Any learning process actually involves some interactions between the learners, the learners and the teachers, the, the machines, the artifacts, the devices. The, and in many ways, we can capture these interactions. These interactions are inherently relational. There are relations and connections between the parts of the interaction process. They are interdependent, so the, the actions of a student are uh, facilitated or constrained by his peers or teachers or the, the artifact that he's working with. And they all, as we are all, following the universal law of time. It's moving forward, it's uh, unidirectional, and they unfold in time. <clears throat> These interactions have long been represented uh, as compiled or aggregate network. And I will explain what is that. For example, if somebody says to another person, can you help explain why we can represent that as an itch or what we call itch actually as a node from the, the speaker to the receiver and we call this an itch. And an aggregate network is a compilation of all these interactions between these two people and would draw them nicely in a nice sociogram as that. <clears throat> in, to show that in video, this is what we actually do. We compile all the interactions until we reach the aggregate network on the right side. Previous work in learning analytics have used network uh, methods to visualize quantitative networks to, to understand the generative models of networks. And such work has actually achieved significant progress in providing us with tools and methods to understand collaborative processes with such aggregate networks. However, <clears throat> these methods or the aggregate methods that overlooks the dimension of time ignores the regulation, the rhythm of engagement or regulation or social co-regulation. They regulate, they, they overlook the regularities or irregularities. They ignore when certain events happen and when some rules emerge, when some actions or some events uh, happen and when some, for example, some communities form and these communities might at some times also be overlooked. I will show some examples with videos in uh, uh, moving forward. Compressing by using this aggregate network, we are compressing, uh, compressing a complex temporal process, which is learning. And that might be oversimplifying and also reductionist. But, you know, every process we have in life likes this aggregate thing. For example, our paper has been, we just got an aggregate response, accepted or rejected, or passed or failed. We like aggregation. And aggregation is kind of a final conclusion of many things, actually. <clears throat> While the temporal networks that we will use today capture the rhythm of the learning process, whether that rhythm inherent to student self-regulation of learning or adaptive to learning design. <clears throat> This is on the left side, again, is an aggregate network. And on the right side, we see in the real time what happens in a temporal network. The structure of a temporal network is a bit different than the usual aggregate networks. It has the dimension of time. And there are two types of this aggregate network, or probably many, but these are the most common types. The first, we call it contact sequence. The context sequence is basically ignores the duration of an interaction. For example, in um, instant messaging, there is no duration for that interaction. So we represent on the left side, this is a context sequence temporal network. There has been an interaction between A and C and F and I in T1 or the first moment or first minute or first time epoch. And there has been an interaction between C and, and D and uh, G and I in the second time epoch. 
This is all represented, as you can see, as an aggregate network on the right side. It ignores that process. That process is only can be uh, seen by the context sequence. The other type of network is what we call an interval graph. <clears throat> an interval graph takes into account the duration of the interaction. For example, there has been an interaction between node one and node two, and uh, that has lasted that duration. This interaction has formed or activated at this moment and deactivated at that moment, according to the terminology you might be liking to use. This picture is taken from the Book of Temporal Networks by Peter Holman and Yari Selimark. Anyhow, <clears throat> our study involved 55 students. Uh, they are studying in, in a method called problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is based uh, is a around 50 years old method with around 50,000 publications around the methods, pretty well structured, pretty well orchestrated. Students know what to do and how to do. And there are uh, predefined rules for everyone. It relies on a weekly problem. They get a weekly problem, open-ended problem, such as, for example, if you have somebody who had an accident, who happens to be a diabetic and um, also pregnant, what can you do first? Shall you make an x-ray? Shall you do something? Students start to debate. X-ray might harm the, uh, the baby or probably we should give her ABC, which is a basic emergency measures first before we go to investigation, such things. Uh, students are typically in small groups and they typically have a moderating teacher. <clears throat> The process happens mostly in online, but we have some kind of a session that they meet physically and discuss things. So they identify the problem in the first stage, they brainstorm about the problem, they identify the learning objectives, and then they share the, what they have learned uh, throughout the week until they go into the last stage, which they conclude, evaluate their performances, have some kind of reflection of what they have done, and also receive peer feedback. This whole process is happening online in threaded discussions such as these. <clears throat> and this is what we've actually analyzed. These are just mock examples. Representing <clears throat> an aggregate network or a usual network from uh, a temporary network is pretty straightforward in, you know, in what we call reply network. Carmen has replied to Emma, then we draw an, an edge from Carmen to Emma. But for a temporal network, we need four components, a source, a target, an onset, or the time that interaction started to happen, and resolution when that time the interactions ended. We had several, actually, several options to do that. The first, <clears throat> so we, com we consider that as just as everyone, the source is the post writer, the target is the person who would reply to, the time of post was the onset that was pretty straightforward, but we faced the problem of the duration or offset or when this edge deactivates. <clears throat> so we had several options. I will explain what we've done here because that, that's really important. We could have ignored completely the duration of the post and went with a context sequence, which would be an easy and straightforward solutions. We could have used the time to receive a reply, but then we will if we will do that, we will kind of discredit the person who said something valuable that received the immediate reply. And it will be antithesis of what we're doing already. Or we take the time from the post that had been made until the last time that post generated interactions around it. Many online forums, when we have inspirations from them, deactivates posts or uh, threads when they receive no interactions. And we said, okay, if somebody posts a post and that post continues to be discussed, means the idea is still active, then that's the last, the time of that post. Of course, it's not ideal because all the discussion board software do not accurately record such process. We also, by the way, experimented with the last thread of the post by groups. But then we found that we have uh, a range of one day to 45 days since the first thread to the last thread, which turned out to be really not a very good idea at all. <clears throat> the data was analyzed with R. Uh, 
please refer to the paper to see the libraries that we have used. And uh, we had in that course, 3000 interactions, 30 and 34, most of them had been interactions between the students and students, student and teacher were around 83, teacher to student were about were around 256. Uh, this has been the dynamic network of the course, as you might see on the left side. The, it's a static picture, we see nothing, but on the right side, you see the rhythm of interactions. I'll explain more what does it mean, but that rhythm, this burst in nature, it's just actually, is actually a, um, a title of a book, one of the pioneers of network science have released a little while ago, where he said that the bursts are the hidden patterns behind everything we do, from your email to bloody crusades. <clears throat> but what, what is actually that means? What does that rhythm mean? If we look in, on the top of this picture, if you see my mouse, here we have an aggregate network of a week of interactions. And on Monday, we see an interactive picture between many students and they're in discussing their learning objectives and topics and everything. It's pretty well and uh, we see that there are kind of good interactions among students. On the second day, on Tuesday, we still have some nice interactions happening between students. However, on Wednesday, only three or four are still active and engaged with the topic of the problem. On Thursday, students have completely ceased to interact and the second and the fifth and sixth and maybe seventh stage of the problem-based process is completely for, uh, forsaken, not, not being done. On the seventh day, which is Friday again, students are inactive, nobody is discussing or having reflection on their performance, nobody's giving peer feedback, nobody is you know, discussing the conclusions of what they've done and reflecting on the process of interactions, which actually ignores, I would say, one third of the problem-based process. Just looking at the top picture or a top network is really, does not really tell that at all, which, you know, by using the temporal network, we could visually spot something like that. It wasn't obvious at all by using that static aggregate or, you know, end of course or end of week network. The structural properties of the network we've studied, we have <clears throat> the density was 0.78, the mean degree was 113 or 14. We had uh, 1,185 ties that were mutual and around 0.65 transitivity. But this doesn't tell us much as you could see when you have this kind of statistics about the whole course, it doesn't tell much. For a temporary network, we have a real time uh, graphical representations of the, of the network. As you can see, this is the density of interactions. I'm starting from day zero. The density rises up until day two or three, and then the fourth day or fifth day, we have almost no interactions. And this rhythm repeats on a weekly basis. The rhythm is not different on the mutual interactions, so people do not reply to each other on the fourth and fifth day. We have actually not much interactions happening in these days. The mean degree is the same. The simulian ties are also the same. They form mostly on the beginning of the week and lately in, around the middle of the month, there is none of that. that but you know, close to the end of the course, students probably reactivate again. But again, the, the, the best time of the course probably is the first, I would say 40%. It sees more mutuality, more interactions, more simulian ties and more activities. <clears throat> and uh, if I zoom in, you see this in just the second week, you see again that day 12, day 13, day 14, we have not such interactions that we wish they could be there. Uh, this is actor mixing, who is interacting with who in which time, and this uses a temporal exponential random graph model, but this is not important. If you can see the, the blue line, this is the high achiever students, the top high achievers, they start the interactions. They mix with the low, the, the, the green ones are the low achievers. They, they probably come in later, a little bit later. This pattern actually repeats 
across every single week. The high achievers start the interaction, the low achievers come following, and they mix almost at the middle time, at the uh, mid time. If we look at the tutor, which is the, the bottom two lines, the tutor engaged with the high achievers and low achievers almost in the same pattern. He does not devote so much time, for example, to engage more or to interact more with the low achievers, which probably need more of his attention. So this kind of work, or this kind of graph tells us what we can tell the tutor to do. Please, you know, pay more attention. It's, in, it's okay to, to have such kind of interactions with the high achievers. Please try to pay more attention to the low achievers. We also can see that the tutor also follow this pattern. He's not activating this sixth or seventh stage of jump, we call it in the problem-based learning terminology. He does not activate the students to reflect on their performance or have metacognitive reflections on how things went and you know, reflect on the group and the conclusions of the problem, which is also another conclusion that we could tell the, the, the tutor, please you know, help students to follow the script that has been assigned before. Something that all learning analytics people like to correlate with performance, and we have done that. Uh, please note that these are dynamic degrees, centrality, not just the centralities we know, so time is taken into the account of calculation. And we have calculated that for every day in the course. We ended up with a huge 400 variable uh, data set. So we have dynamic degree, dynamic out degree, dynamic in degree, dynamic betweenness flow. What is that? This is kind of a modified betweenness since we found that uh, the usual betweenness centrality is uh, when we had the resolution of a single day, did not really tell us much. So we had to resort to a modified form that takes into account two or three steps of a student being among two others. And also dynamic eigen centrality. Some might ask where is closeness centrality that many people would use. Closeness centrality really gets uh, uh, not that very good results when we have disconnected students. And as you, you have seen, we always have disconnected students at a resolution of a single day. And we correlated this with continuous assessment by the teachers and what they do. Continuous, oh, sorry, this is, sorry. Continuous assessment, final grade, and uh, the, 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 the total of the students. You see that in the next slide. <clears throat> So we have the total, that just, which is total grades, final, which is total rating grade, and their assessment results. Uh, you might see here in each and every one, I, I probably would focus because these are around 700 correlations. Each time a correlation is positive, it's, it's drawn on the, on the axis, and each time it's insignificant, it, it goes to zero level. From the first day, you see that degree centrality, flow centrality, and eigen centrality are highly correlated with performance. This is in the first day, second day, third day, fourth and fifth day of the week, there is no correlation at all because there is no actually interactions. And this pattern happens almost every week. We have these correlations on the second, or the first, second, third day, fourth, fifth day are almost you know, not that very significant, except for the second week where students get into the, the real work or the serious work. We also have learned some nice conclusions, for example, that in degree gets only significantly correlated with performance a little bit of late or with a lag of, of one single day. So it's almost significant on the second day, which is, you know, logic because it takes time to get a reply or something. The, the degree is, since it samples that what you get and what you what you say, or the in degree and out degree, it is actually higher, highly correlated and much more robust than the other uh, centralities regarding correlation. <clears throat> We've done also uh, regression with tenfold cross validation, and uh, we used only the second day, since as you've seen, the second day was almost the most. Uh, significantly correlated day. And from the first week, we could have, we were able to have an R square of 0.46, second week, third week, that drops around the mid course, since a little bit kind of the performance wanes or something or their uh, engagement with the course. And then just before the, 
the exam. And then of course, the last week before the exam, nobody's really very well engaged with the process. They are studying for the final exams. We have also done the usual regression on a daily basis, again, to see which factors could were actually predictive of performance. As you can see on each and every week, we had the flow between the centrality. And that could be explained by uh, the reason that the way that we have sampled more than one step. So if you have been engaged in a thread that, that has been discussed for quite a while and, and garnered a lot of in, engagement and enthusiasm among students, then you're probably saying something valuable. And uh, it has been in every single day the most significant, the only significant almost uh, centrality measure that has been with performance. We've done also a static model. In the static model, we have the dynamic flow and the static flow again, the, the flow centrality has been also the one that is mostly correlated. We had also the static in degree, which is a representation of you always receive replies when you say something valuable in such context. Then one might ask, does the static or dynamic centrality offers a better alternative to the usual ones? We have found mixed results, but they're not exactly mixed. For the out degree centrality is the static outperformed, or the, or the degree centrality is the out degree and in degree. The static centralities offer the, offer the highly correlated and mostly, you know, as you can see, uh, consistently higher than the usual ones, probably because the time or the time accuracy that we have measured was not the, was not the best way to go through that. However, with the, with the temporal network, the dynamic flow centrality, it has been highly correlated, and so is with the dynamic ones. We can conclude from that that quantitative centralities, just like the degree and out degree, might perform not that as well as expected in, in a temporal uh, context, but the, the path-based centrality, just like flow and eigen centralities, will perform much better than the usual ones. Uh, we are uh, thinking of developing that work to include multimodal temporal network analysis. And we had actually a, a, a conference paper about that. Thank you. And uh, uh, looking forward to hear your questions.